Hi, this is Ted Richards, and you're listening to the Swans blog, Swans Cast. And welcome to another episode of the Swans Blog Swans Cast. Tonight, I am joined by Stephen Trelaw from Over the Line Sports. Stephen, how are you? Yeah, not bad, Justin. Yourself? Very well, thank you. And I'm also joined by a very special guest, 2012 Premiership hero, Swan great, Ted Richards. How are you? Thanks very much, Justin. And good morning to people that are listening to it in the morning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully I'll get it out in the morning, but... <laughs> Now, um, now, Ted, you've uh, turned a successful, if not workmanlike, football career into another successful career in finance. You've been interviewed many times since you transitioned into post-football career, often citing hard work, grit, determination, attention to detail and discipline as skills that you've been able to transfer into finance that served you well in football. Can you tell us a little bit about your career development in finance? while you were playing football for the Swans, such as working for Citigroup and John Savoy at Early Funds Management. Yeah, sure, Justin. Um, you've done you've done your homework there, and um, I um, I have been putting a lot of things in place while I've been playing football, and um, I guess that all comes back to the fact that um, how I saw myself whilst playing football was that I was never someone that was always going to be lucky enough to have a a 16 year career like I had that I always felt that I was always I don't know one year or one game away from um, uh, my last season so I needed to, I wanted to be um, as best prepared if that was the case so um, um, yeah I'm not sure if does that answer your question so you did your you started your master's study around 2009 was it yeah, I um, finished a uh, Bachelor of Commerce, I think, in 2009. I think I started my Master's in 2000. And, uh, no, 2000 and, I think I finished the Bachelor in 2010. I finished the, started the Master's in 2011. So you, were at the same time as playing football, were actually studying for your Bachelor of Commerce? Yeah, so I, um, uh, I'm pretty proud of this. I, um, I studied for 15 years straight, and during that 15 years, I only took one semester off, and... Um, Wow, I probably took a bit longer to do um, just the two degrees than um, what other people might have taken, but um, uh, I was definitely the tortoise when it came to uh, achieving that. <laughs> uh, definitely more impressive than me. My art, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's 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 you know it's it's tough. In early days, I, I, I failed the odd subject, and sometimes even more than the odd subject. But um, I kept at it, and that. Um, persistence and um was what i was proud of because i knew that if i was to have a year off it was it'd probably be pretty hard to start that habit again is it commonplace for afl clubs especially including the swans to support footballers in post football career development while they play for their clubs you know especially like tafe and university degrees yeah i i it is it is um as afl players we're very lucky in that um we're paid well to to do something that that most of us absolutely love, and also we've got a support network that can encourage and support people that are willing to to put things in place, I guess, to prepare for their next career. But no one's going to do anything for you. The onus is still on the individual, the player, to commit and to show up and study, and when the eyes aren't on you, and so. Unfortunately, we still have still have people that um, choose to, I guess, waste their opportunities and um, their spare time doing other things. And that, uh, but we've also still got guys that take those opportunities. And um, and I'll I'll use Nick Smith as an example. Nick Smith is um I think he's just finished his a Bachelor of Economics, and you know he's a superstar player, all Australian, and Nick someone that. Yeah. Uh, but he was almost a bachelor of the year, Stephen. Oh, almost, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a he was nomi- a nomination, and um, uh, but um, yes, yeah, sm- you know, it's, Smooch is just one example of someone at the Swans that's taken those opportunities. But um, 
and not everyone's like that. I just wanted to add, um, that's fair enough, because I, I follow the um, emails from a guy called the Barefoot Investor. He did an interview with uh, Brad Scott at the North Melbourne Footy Club, and they yeah. had a really good talk about how um, how players, because they, they get a large chunk of their kind of life's income in those early years, and how they kind of use that money is so important, and there are all these kind of temptations, and the way they use that money uh, can kind of send them down the toilet after footy. So it's great to kind of have that post-footy career set up and to think about that while you're playing. Um, so you spoke with SEN earlier this year about your brother and life after the Swans uh, and studying a Masters of Commerce while applying his trade for Sydney Uni. Uh, so is Xavier kind of following in your footsteps or does he kind of uh, plan to forge his own career? Um, I, th- I think Zav's situation is, is unique to himself. Um, much publicised Zav's exit from the Swans and AFL, and um, yeah, that was that was for a variety of reasons. Where Zav wanted to test the market and um, you know see if he could um, you know get a price for because he was out of contract and it, and much publicised. It didn't work out well, but he's trying to make the most of uh, the opportunity that he's in right now. And um, he was considering playing football in the VFL and the Waffle and the Sandful. But um, when Sydney Uni came to him with an op- an opportunity to play football for them and um, be involved in a master's program with through them and get a, into a graduate position at a, um, a multinational company. Um, Zav had to kind of reassess as to where he was at a 20, as a 24-year-old and he decided to take that opportunity because um, as much as he'd love to get picked up again, he's aware that not too many 24- and 25-year-olds get picked up out of the draft. Yeah, fair enough, and uh, good on him too. I mean, I think Swans fans, I mean, we don't know all the details about what's happening in Xavier's life, his life decisions, but I think we can all say we wish the best for him in the future. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, think it, yeah, I, I think a lot comes to, I think a lot comes down to that. Um, a lot of people ask, why did Xavier say that he wanted to, I guess, uh, move back to Melbourne if he's staying in Sydney? And um, Zav was of the opinion that he didn't want to come out publicly and say that... He, he just wanted more money. He um, he thought that he'd come out and publicly say that um, um, I moved back to Melbourne was what he was after, and um, uh, and you know, I, and I can understand that that strategy too. But um, um, as we know, uh, it is what it is. Yeah, fair enough. Now back to you. You've had a bit of a meteoric rise in your finance investment management career. So, and this is just months after your fo- professional football career ended. You started working for Six Park this year, which is a finance investment group uh, firm based out of Melbourne, and now you're a director of the company, from what I hear. So, can you tell us who Six Park are and what you do, and how you came to be a director in the company? Yeah, sure, Stephen. Um, so, Six Park, um, we're we're a startup, and we're a, a robo advisor, and a robo advisor can be quite a a uh, intimidating term, but the, the, so we're, we're we're an automated investment management service, and um, so instead of maybe seeing a financial advisor and um, paying quite expensive fees to sit down face to face, we automate part of that process, and um, with those reduced fees, we pass that on to our clients. So um, um, that's where I'm working, and um, uh, as you suggested, I am. Um, I am a director of the company, but um, and as mu- as much as I'd love to um, pretend we're a huge company, we're we're just a startup. So um, uh, with a startup and a staff of about five or six people, it's not too hard to be a director when uh, there's only uh, there's only about six of us. Oh, don't sell yourself too short. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> look, you also host your own finance investment podcast, The Richards Report, uh, which you've described as being about breaking the jargon down and helping listeners better understand investing. Um, I actually heard, listened, watched, uh, listened to the, the podcast earlier tonight. I've absolutely loved it. Uh, will this become a regular Ted Richards hosted show? And what motivated you to start the podcast? And what sort of topics are you going to discuss in the future? It's a good, good question, Stephen. So, um, yeah, in my work at, uh, at, at Six Park and, and discussing automated investments and, and the, the strengths to it. And we invest through ETFs and um, 
not all ETFs are the same. That there's there are some great ETFs and there are some um, risky ETFs. And mm. I was having these discussions with people, and a lot of people aren't aware of what an ETF are. And with you know, discussing more and more with people, a lot of these acronyms that are quite widely used in the investing and finance world can be intimidating for people. And this jargon that quite often people speak speaking to make themselves sound more sophisticated and more intelligent is unnecessary. So. I wanted to create a podcast where I could kind of break down this jargon, help explain to people what, for example, an ETF is, which is an exchange trade, traded fund. And that's just what I used in the first episode. But um, in later episodes, we'll, we'll discuss different ways of p- potentially valuing businesses, you know, look at things how, and I'm just talking off the top of my head here, when someone says an EBIT multiple, it sounds quite impressive, but they, you know what does that represent? And that you're talking about earnings before interest and tax, and multiplying that a few times to get a valuation on a business is a, a quite a commonly accepted way of valuing a business. But a lot of the times, people just put acronym after acronym, and it, it's a, it's a, it's a foreign language in the end. Yeah, definitely. And you were chatting with uh, Damien Sherman, who's the head of uh, Vanguard, their capital markets. Uh, kind of company yeah. there and that was um that was great just in terms of asking those questions which some people might not even think to kind of ask before kind of plunging into the market so that's great oh thanks well i i, I think that's um uh, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea and i i do love a bit of banter and a bit of fun and i'm probably steering a bit more towards the more serious um side of things but um you know, just asking Damien, who's head of ETF capital markets at Vanguard, and Vanguard are the second biggest fund in the world after um, BlackRock. Asking Damien, who's a very smart, intelligent guy, Damien, can you explain to me what an index is? Because we all know that word, but when someone talks about an Aussie index, it, it can be a bit, I guess, a bit foreign to some people that an index might represent the 200 biggest companies in the world. And uh, in Australia, and you don't have to always stock pick. There's a way that you can get exposure to all those those shares, and there's different ways of um, buying those assets. So uh, uh, that's that's the area that I'm working in, and uh, time will tell as to whether the podcast is a success or not. But I'm trying to um, create something that's of value to people that um, maybe have an interest in in um, investing but uh just don't know where to start yeah well i can tell you now as someone who's kind of just about to start investing myself and maybe even considering korean finance you definitely have one subscriber here mate so well done <laughs> oh i appreciate that Stephen. so um <laughs> and, and now uh, I, I i i you know i'm biased i you know go and check us out at six park um uh I, we do have a great little business there where and i'm, I'm quite proud of it we're um um financial advisors where you meet face to face they can they can be quite expensive and um like i said we automate that process and we uh charge a much less reduced fee compared to others that's a it's a pretty good plug there and um thanks very for, much guys for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> i know that some of our, our listeners and subscribers um definitely are in the finance industry or dabble so i think that's going to be fantastic for them to understand a bit more about what kind of investments and how they kind of make those investments as well. And no worries. Um, now, I did have another question. Yeah, sure. You had a you had an unlucky run with concussions in your last season. You know, you suffered two in the space of a year with the highest profile one being, you know, the mark you took against the Hawks. You know, what does it feel like when something like that happens? And, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, concussion assessment at matches and you know, mandatory selection and exclusion periods after concussions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my 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 last concussion was quite um, high profile for no other reason than I think that it well a, a contributing factor is the fact that it happened on a Friday night, and, I, and I'm of the belief that if things happen in Friday night football, that you can um, magnet, magnify them by three times compared to something that may have happened in the Sunday one o'clock game. So. Um, a lot of people saw it, and um, with me at my age, and have having a few concussions um, scattered throughout my career. Um, it was it did get a bit of, um, I guess, some news. But um, 
to answer your question, I'm of the opinion that um, most teams handle it really well, but um, uh, I would like to see, and I'm, I think I'm in the minor minority here, I'd like to see the concussion determined by an unbiased um, medical officer, a doctor, because yep. um, I'm very happy with how the swans looked after me. But um, I do think that there can be a conflict for um, the doctors that um, uh, I've got to make a call on a player, but also, uh, uh, you know, are an employee of a, a football team that are going out to win the game. And so um, I've spoken about this with many Swans staff and many and the, and the Swans doctor that I just think that it's a better model to um, just have someone that's uh, without the conflict, unbiased, making that call because um, Swans do it great, but you can't you can't say that it's like that in every team because the, the, the conflict remains. And there's also a lot of research that still has to be done, not only on what impact concussions have to players when they suffer a concussion, but the long-term effects as well. And throughout the you know early to mid part of 2000s, there was quite a lot of uh, occasions when players were clearly concussed and then they came back on the field 10, 15 minutes later after being you know knocked out and seeing stars. There was one particular Essendon player who was off for 15 minutes. I'm not sure if it's Hurley or someone else. Um, but he came back on and played the rest of the game and was clearly concussed and could you know, barely make things happen, but he still played out the game. Yeah, I, I, I saw that over the course of my career. Um, it's more so early days. My first season at Essendon was 2001. And, um, you know, it was, it was relatively common for, for these stories. And it was... A badge of honour. It was considered brave. It was considered tough that someone was able to see the game out. And yeah, you know, we've all heard these stories. And, and but times have changed, and um, um, it's there's still a lot of unknowns. But I think where we're heading is in a much better place than where we were ten years ago. Absolutely, and I think the AFL has taken a really good forward step in ensuring that there is a lot of support for players who are concussed and rules have been changed in place of that. Do you think that the substitute for concussion needs to be re-implemented? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I haven't really thought about that in, in terms of a um, concussion substitute because, um, it, you know, say if someone does their knee in the first 10 minutes, does that team qualify for someone to come on? Um, so I, I'm going to reserve my judgment a bit there because I haven't really considered that. But I think um, if someone's concussed, then they have, they've got to go off. I'm, I'm not sure whether we need to bring someone on or not. No, that's fair enough. And uh, the Swans against the Hawks earlier in round 10 this year, they suffered a very early concussion to Lloyd, and they also had another player go off injured before half-time, which was Sam Reid. But Collingwood um, have proven that you still can win matches with just two players on the bench, and they've done it twice this year. So I do remember as a punter and as a fan that when the original substitute rule was brought in, the idea was for injured players. But it kind of turned out to be exploited as more of a uh, tactical substitution than an actual medical substitution more often than not. Yeah, I, I, I'm, like I said, I'm a, a bit unsure in my decision there. I'm more of the opinion that I lo I'd like to see a red card come in and if if someone does something stupid like uh, a Melbourne player did uh, when we played them <laughs> earlier this year, that, um, yep. uh, yeah, that, you know, we, I'm, you know, Callum Mills, poor Callum went down and, um, uh, I'm more of the opinion that our red card system is more important. Now, I do have a, another question. This is from one of the followers. Um, he he kind of mentioned something. He mentioned the Riches Report, and I thought he was talking about the podcast. But when are we going to see a return of the Richards Report column? That's, that's, that's a good question. I, um, I contemplated writing one at, at the end of the season because I just wanted to um, um, publicly... Thank everyone for, I guess, being a part of my football journey, and um, I, th I thought that would be the best avenue to do it. And lazy me, probably had one too many big night and uh, just um, lost my track there. But um, 
and I probably lost the moment there now, but um, I, 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 I do have a lot of fond memories of sitting away at the keyboard and um, writing the odd report and putting it up on the website. Uh, I w probably have went for about three or four years there until um, my son came along and life got in the way. I think I speak for many fans. We'd love to see it come back again at least for a bit of a finale. <laughs> <laughs> Even a late one. Yeah. I can, I'm certainly happy to set you up an account. Don't worry about that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the uh, next segment. Now, we do our heroes and villains of the week. So, we each pick a hero and each pick a villain. So, um, Stephen, would you like to kick us off with your hero? And please don't pick Callum Sinclair. <laughs> nah, no, I won't. Tempting as it is, but I think we'll have a bit of a talk about him later. Uh, my hero, as, as much as it kind of pains me to say it, uh, the Collingwood Football Club. Um, their last quarter against the Eagles... Uh, there were two men down, and they showed grit, which we haven't really seen too much of this year, and they got the win. Um, kind of further cementing the uh, West Coast away from home. Kind of almost a bit of a meme now these days. But, uh, yes, yeah, uh, credit to Collingwood, I think, more than... Uh, well, and as well, I think, a uh, uh, poor form from the Eagles. But... Yeah, I think Collingwood really stood up. Uh, their inside contested game was immense, and they got the they got the win. So good on them. Now, Ted, do you yourself have a hero of the week? Uh, hero of the week, I'm going to say is Jason Bennett. I think it's Jason Bennett, the um, the football commentator. I, I um, he called he called our game on the weekend, and I just think he's an underrated uh, football commentator. There's no unnecessary banter going on while the game's on. Yep. He calls it as he sees it, and I just think he's um, he's an underrated uh, caller of the game. Now, did he do the Giants-Tigers game? Uh, I didn't watch Giants-Tigers, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Because there was that commentator who, again, was I, I might have been Bennett. Um, again, no nonsense, just called the game as it was, and it was quite nice to watch, actually. Yeah, it, it's just, um, I think, football... At its purest, doesn't need anything on top. And, um, um, you know, Dennis Committee, he probably was able, one of the few that was able to kind of add that extra layer of cream to a, it where, with his, his incredible <laughs> vocab that he had. But um, um, uh, I just I just think football in its pure form with just a, a caller. I think Jared Waitley's a great caller of the game, and um, but we, um, we don't get him on, on TV. He's more of a radio caller. Yeah, he does some um, special comments on Foxtel as well, and he's always very insightful and very intelligent with what he says. Yeah. Now, uh, my hero of the week, uh, obviously, is this one. It's uh, Callum Sinclair. Uh, he's it's now. I would like to know a little bit about uh, what you think of as, as a teammate, but from the outside looking in, it kind of looked at the start of last year that he struggled a bit for fitness. He played the first couple of games. He was quite often cramping in the last quarters, uh, especially the Carlton game, which was at that point his best game for the Swans. I think it was about round four or five. And then he kind of found himself on the sidelines for the rest of the season as the Tippett-Naismith combination grew. And this year he's improved, steadily improved every week, every week. And then he just went bang last week. Five goals, eight contested marks, 10 marks, 6 marks inside 50, and that is the best contested performance since Barry Hall in 2008, and the third best since Champion Data started recording in 1999. Absolutely fantastic. Well, yeah, you, you've done your homework there. I, I, I didn't, I was unaware of how, what 6 contested marks inside 50, how that, that ranks compared to people over the last 10 or 20 years. So to hear that, 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 that is huge. Um, yeah, I, I just think, and, and I think... Um, uh, Jake Carlisle was probably on Callum Sinclair for a lot of the night too. So, and Carlisle burnt him you know, on one yeah. lead. He absolutely smoked him when he got that bomb from sixty meters. He smoked him on the lead. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that even uh, gives even a bit more credit to uh, Callum because he was doing all this on a really good opponent. Yeah, and as a teammate, um, did he sort of? On a fitness level, did he sort of struggle to adjust? Because he did say it during the preseason that the Swans were doing a lot more running than the Eagles were doing. 
in 2015? Um, no, I, I, I think, um, you know, if that's the case, um, we, we might we may do a bit more running, but I, I think for Callum, and this happens to, to every player, it's not specific to Callum, sometimes you, you just you get a knock on the knee or something like that, and it takes about four or five weeks for it to heal, and you're very training, you're very limited in how much you can train, and you're just doing what you can throughout the week to get up for the game. And um, I always thought that you can probably get away with that for one or two weeks, and um, but when it extends to four or five or plus plus weeks, it's it's really hard to you're just slowly detraining your body. And I, I, from memory, I think that might have happened to Callum last year where he was just doing what he could to get up for games and um, um, because he had he had some soreness in his knees. And um, it's, like I said, short term, you're able able to get away with it, but long term, which um, it might have caught up with him a bit last year. But my understanding is that he's been playing really good football in the reserves right now and got an opportunity and hasn't he taken it? Yeah, I mean, it just adds to that kind of tall forward and ruck depth, and it's it's something that I wasn't expecting to. I wasn't expecting the kind of career best performance like that from Callum, but it's just such so good to see. And I'm really happy for the guy as well. Yeah, I, I, I think um, you got to remember that uh, yeah, the footy players are humans, and uh, it can yeah. be it can be tough to be in the reserves. I'm sure Callum wants to play seniors every week and. Um, how excited he is by getting an opportunity, but but to make the most of that, and he won't take anything for granted. He knows that he'll probably be picked the next week, but he's got to sustain this because um, the Swans are in a great position where we've got a, um, healthy competition. So, um, um, yeah, I'm really excited for Callum because, um, you know, he, he's done it. Tough so far up up to this point of the season, and um, who knows how the season's going to finish off for him. Now, Stephen, do you have a villain of the week? I do, uh, Mr. Toby Green. Now, <laughs> again, look, yep. <laughs> this is the second yeah. time you've picked him. Second time. Yeah, I feel like he does. I mean, honestly, he deserves it. GWS, they've been a absolutely. They've had terrible luck in terms of injuries. Uh, they're in pretty bad form when it comes to getting wins on the table. So punching Alex Rance, of all people, who's who I've I've been, my humble opinion, has been known to milk it a little bit every now and then. Against um, the Swans, he did, I saw it live, and that was awful. Punch anyone else, not Alex Rance. <laughs> um, but, I mean, look, <laughs> with, their, with their injuries, it just makes his action even more idiotic. And I think... Uh, it was Titus O'Reilly. He said, uh, Leon Cameron said he knows Toby Green's heart's in the right place, but it's not his heart we're concerned about. It's his fists. So, <laughs> GWS, they want, they want to be a finals contender. You can't have your star players doing crap like this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Ted, for, uh, from your own experience, if a player was doing that on the eve of the finals, what would the team be saying to that sort of player? Yeah, I, I think um, if if it, the player does it once um, and they're apologetic um, and they're apo- you know for what they've done and co- costing the team, I think you might put it down to an aberration. But if a track record starts to pop up, then uh, that's a bit more serious. So, um, and you might even call it selfish, where someone's putting their their own interests in front of the team. So. Um, I can't speak for other teams, but um, uh, yeah, I'd be pretty disappointed in a player that was had a track record of um, making decisions that are more important to them than uh, what the team is needs. Now, it's also the third time he's been pulled up this year on striking. Uh, the first time he was fined, and then the last two times he's been rubbed out for two weeks each. So there's... Uh there's a little bit of a problem there that uh, the Giants will definitely need to get on top of before the finals. Now, Ted, do you have a villain of the week? I don't, I don't have a villain of the week. I, I forgot to answer this question, but um, maybe a late nomination for a parking inspector that gave me a ticket uh, yesterday. So uh, I'm, <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, that's just kind of um, one that's a bit a bit off field, way off field. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> um, hey, it's always yeah. related no matter what. Yeah, and, and um 
Yeah, I, so uh, I didn't actually even see the car, but my wife told me we got a ticket. So, uh, uh, so there's a villain out there somewhere. <laughs> now, um, for my villain of the week, I'm doing. It's they're related, but they're two. The first one is Geelong, and the second one is Dangerfield. Now, uh, he looked pretty sore last week, and then he did the press conference at the start of the week where he went a bit overboard with the bandages and the crutch and the moon boot and played it up a bit, and then he was sort of over in Adelaide a day earlier doing a lunch and sort of over in Adelaide. And um, then his performance on the weekend, it just wasn't quite up to Dangerfield scratch. It just didn't have that usual flair and the usual bullishness, and you could kind of put it down to maybe is he still injured, but... I just think with the antics in a week, Geelong's performance was very lacklustre. It didn't really have anything in that first half. So Geelong and Dangerfield for mine. What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, from my opinion, before the game started, I said to my wife, um, we, we sat down for a romantic night to watch that game. And uh, I said to her, I said, you, uh, everyone was pumping up Geelong, but I said, oh, you watch Adelaide, Adelaide or... Um, Smack Geelong this game, and um, I, I don't know why I had that feeling. Maybe, maybe it was the amount of attention that um, uh, was going down Geelong and Dangerfield, but I, I just I still think um, Adelaide's an underrated team, even though they sit on top of the ladder. Yeah, I agree with you there. That midfield group in particular. I mean, there's a lot of talk about Rory Sloan and whether he can handle the tag, but even guys like the Crouch brothers. I mean, they got what is it, 32 and 29 possessions each, um, and Guys like Douglas, who really who had four goals as well, like they have a lot of guys who can stand up and really perform. Yeah, they went yeah. head to head with them, and they beat them uh, quite comfortably too. It's a yeah. it's a formidable formidable place to play football at Adelaide Oval, and um, if as it looks like they're going to finish first or second, then um, a lot of finals football is going to be played over there, and um, I'm not sure who's who's going to beat them over there. So. Um, yeah, there's a very good chance they're going to be in the grand final. They could be wearing red and they could be wearing white. The time oh, yes, will tell. Yeah, 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 yes. Time will tell. <laughs> now, uh, it's, it's been a bit of a meteoric rise for the Swans. They've um, kind of done a bit of a Lazar- Lazarus considering the start of the season that they had, um, which was a little bit scandalous, you could say. Um, zero and six and... Not quite playing Swans football, but uh, earlier in the season, they turned it around against the Saints. They put in a very good game after they got their first win against the Lions. And then they've backed it up, and they've gone, since that game, it is seven wins from eight games. Or is it eight from nine? The Swans, again, had a very good, solid performance against the Saints on the weekend. They got over the line by 42 points. At one point, the game was completely camped out in the Swans forward half. The uh, Saints, whenever they got the ball forward, they just looked like they even forgot what the ball looked like or pretty much how to score at all. They had uh, 14 inside 50s at half time, which is unbelievable. Ted, have you ever played in a game where your opposition has had 14 inside 50s? Uh, no, no. Um... That is a fullback's heaven where you'd come off the ground at the end of the, the game and probably still be clean, still be fresh. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Even then, Grunny and Malikin were definitely among the better players in the first half, considering the fact that the Saints weren't even getting the ball down there. Yeah, well, maybe that's what it was. The Saints forwards were pushing right up because they, you know, they couldn't get a touch and it just meant that the defender's job was just to kick the ball back as opposed to stop the ball, stopping the ball. Um, Stephen, what did you think of the game, mate? Yeah, look, I mean, it was a it was just an absolutely comprehensive victory. Uh, credit to Malikin as well, who won the who's got the Rising Star nomination for this week. Absolutely tied up Nick Rewalt and to do such a job on a superstar of the game who has been. It doesn't look like he's been playing that sort of kind of veteran sort of football this year. He's been absolutely great at times this year. So to make him look like he ought to retire now. I couldn't ask for anything better from Lewis, and the way he's kind of cemented his spot and done his role for the team uh, has been really good to see. And, of course, Callum Sinclair as well. Uh, we've talked about his game, but just pivotal uh, in his forward presence and 
if he can keep that form up for the rest of the year, then we've just added another string to our bow as a team and look, look what just come up further up the ladder. Absolutely. And it's been a long time since uh, I think we've seen Franklin play second fiddle to anyone else. And even then, he still managed to kick three goals and sort of started tearing the game apart at one point in the second half. Yeah, it kicks a very from outside 50 as well. Yeah, goes long, goes long, owed, goes gold. I owed that to a, a Callum Sinclair contested mark as well. So, I think I think my favourite mark of the night was probably quite an underrated mark, but Georgie Hewitt found himself up forward on Nick Rewalt at one point oh, in the game. Yes. And Georgie outmarked Nick Rewalt. And I thought, oh, you know, I thought, how good is that for Georgie's ego? Just yep. uh, he would have know, loved it. <laughs> Rewalt is you know, an absolute champion of the game. And um, one of the greats. Him too. Yes, and Georgie just outbodied him. And <laughs> I thought, if I was Georgie, I'd be getting a photo of that and that's going straight up on the yep. wall. And I'd possibly contemplate him getting a tattoo of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, we're watching the game and talking about the land room and just sort of, ah, oh, cue it on. No, wait. And he gets to Marcus just like, what <laughs> no, the heck yeah, is I happening? <laughs> I, 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 I loved it. And then we saw... Um, Heaney lay a emphatic tackle that uh, I don't know why it had to go to the MRP. That was a bone crunchingly good tackle. Oh. Yeah. I think did he get a fine for it or did he get away with it? No, they got well, away they, with it. What else oh, could he fantastic. have done? Yeah, he, the guy, I don't think it was um, Dunstan or, or Geary. Geary, Geary. Yeah, Geary. Yeah, Geary. So he's jumped up. I don't know if he's tried to jump over him, but he's jumped up in the air to have his arms free. And his momentum has just carried the guy forward. So. I don't know what else he could have possibly done. But if we have a quick look over the match stats, and this what's this is what really gets me about the performance, is that the Swans had 31 scoring shots to 14, but lost the disposal count, the kick count, the handball count, the free kick count, narrowly won the clearances. They dominated the inside 50s, of course, and the marks inside 50. Narrowly won contested possessions after they lost it quite convincingly last week. They had one less tackle and 21 less hitouts and two less interchanges, and they still won by 42 points and dominated the game. That's um, that is one instance of a team just completely overpossessing the ball. Yeah, Seb Ross had 37 touches, um, but only nine contested, uh, three clearances, and three inside 50s. So. That really does kind of blink crazy when you, one of your star midfielders is gathering the ball that much but not really having that impact. Um, it's great to see that we'll, we can let them have the ball and still kind of put on that pressure and hit them at the other end. And, um, Ted, I'd like to sort of get your thoughts on uh, what you think about Dean Towers, the the ruckman, the pinch hitter. I, he, I don't think Dino's getting enough um, recognition for the role that he's playing. But Dean's... Dean's far shorter than me. Dean would be at 187 centimetres or something like that. He's playing ruck against um, not Tom second Vicky, string ruck. Um, yeah, but Dean is doing this every week. And it's it's hugely important for us because um, we can keep Callum up forward when he's playing really well and we don't need to c- completely change the structure of our team around just, just to be able to give... Um, our ruckman arrest, and um, so th- this role that Dino's playing, it's um, it's it's a it's an underrated role, and I, I think the commentators don't really give Dino enough respect. I think um, a lot of Swans fans who have followed Dean's career, I think they're coming around to the fact that he can actually play, and I've certainly cheered him on. I've uh, championed him a few times this season, and, and um, when you jump on some of the social media channels and people are like, drop towels, drop towels, drop towels. It's like, no, 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 you guys have got to watch the game. He's actually doing the right thing. He's running to the right places. You might only get 12 possessions, but he's being an outlet kick from defense. You know, he's leading up, getting the mark on the back flank or the wing, you know, that dump kick out. He's, he's there to mark it and he's, you know, getting some contested ball and he's also rocking it and important link player. He's, I don't think he's the kind of player who's going to get the 28, 30 possessions like a Lloyd does off the back line or even McVeigh when he's getting 22, 23 at his best. But you're right, he does play from a fan's perspective. He plays a very important role in the team. Yeah, he gives us a bit of versatility in that um, 
Um, sometimes he'll find himself on the wing. Sometimes he'll find himself in the ruck, and sometimes he'll he'll be up forward. And that versatility can be dangerous. And yeah, like you said, he may not be the player that's going to kick three or four goals each week or get the thirty disposals, but he's he's a hard and unique player to man up on that covers a lot of ground. And if you don't man him up, so if, if his Dino's opponent wants to zone off to um help um, defend Buddy, then um, Dino can hurt you. But um, So um, it's great to see Dino um, have another another asset in his game. Well, um, the Saints sure didn't man him up. And to be honest, he should have had two to three goals on the weekend. He only managed the one. It was a good goal, that one goal. But he could have had uh, slightly higher dream team points and maybe uh, pushed out Kennedy or Franklin for the brown line. Like, we'll get right up there. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, I was very impressed with his performance, and you know he picked up 19 possessions. Um, and sometimes there's a knock on his disposal efficiency, and uh, one of our casters, uh, Stephen Park, he loves to sort of talk about the disposal efficiency of the side. That I think, like from looking from the outside, one of the evolutions that the Swans have done this season, which I think bodes very well later on in the year, especially if they make the finals is the transition play from defense is uh, kind of a little bit like what Hawthorne used to do, just chip, 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 short pass, short pass, try and get into the corridor, exploit the corridor, go long, but with short players around the ground to trap the ball in and lock the ball in. So it's not like chip, chip, chip the 50 and then try and chip again in. It's just get it long, lock it in. With the pace of Rowan, you get Heaney down there, you get Hewitt rotating, you got Towers, you got Callum Sinclair, who's almost 200 centimeters tall, and he's like an extra midfielder. He gets what, six, eight clearances a game and five, six tackles a game. He's incredible for his size. Papley, you name him, like eight players will rotate through there. So, Yeah, it's the game It's the game style we play, and there's a lot of chat about how our disposal efficiency isn't the best in the league, but we're getting the results. I mean, you can't really knock it that much, can you? Yeah, and I, I, I do think that... Um... Disposal, disposal efficiency is relevant if that's the the style of game. But if you want to you want to go forward and go forward quickly, then um, then sometimes you've just got to do it the ugly way. And there might be um, two on ones, but you scrap it forward and keep working it and um, grind out your goals that way. And right now, um, like you said before, Justin, we do have quite a um, an array of people that can score goals and that makes us I guess um, uh, how do you describe it um, we're unpredictable we're an unpredictable team up forward and that it, and it's hard to defend that and we've had Rowan kick five Reed kick five Franklin's highest is eight Towers has kicked two Sinclair's kicked five uh, Parker's kicked I think two in a game once so you're right, like there are so many players who can go through in that forward line and have an absolutely massive impact. Um, Mills is getting goals, Jack's getting goals, Lloyd's getting goals. So look, um, we'll move on to the next thing. So just want to have a quick chat about the Swans reserves. Now, um, have you been able to catch any of the Swans reserve games this year, Ted? Uh, no, so I live in Melbourne now and... Um... Um, it's you know it's 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 hard getting to uh, see those games. But I was living in Sydney at the start of the season when I would catch the tail end of the the Swans games when I go to go and watch the guys. But um, um, I understand that the team's playing quite well now. They've got healthy competition for spots, and uh, I saw Jordan Dawson had a really good game on the weekend. Hundred ninety six dream team points. It was uh, it was quite ridiculous. And uh, Stephen, you saw most of this game, didn't you? Yeah, I gave it a bit of a watch. I had a um, a stream on the Neapel app, and they have it on YouTube as well, which is pretty good. It's not every game, but I've seen a couple of Swans games. And, I mean, look, the Swans reserves this year, we've only lost one game for the whole season. Our percentage is above 250%. Um, so our, we're absolutely dominating on that front. Uh, and Jordan Dawson's just having an absolutely r- remarkable season. Uh, this game he had... 40 disposals, three goals, 14 marks, eight tackles, you know, no biggie. Um, but, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, I think he's in the top three in the Neafel MVP award. Uh, 
he got his senior debut, which I think was very well deserved. Round, I guess a few games. Six, round seven, yep. Yeah, yeah. Look, he's been remade into um, almost a Josh Kennedy type player, inside midfielder that can go forward and he's moving around the ground. He's He does remind like when you're watching it, it reminds me a lot about Kennedy. He's not like that very quick, energetic kind of looking guy. He's very smooth and you know, very timely and just looks like he's relaxed and knows what he's doing and then just goes bang and then just impacts the game like no other. And Ted, have you um, had a chance to catch Dawson playing in the midfield? Uh, no, I haven't seen much, but I've always seen what he's been capable of. I mean, you're right, he is, he is tall for a midfielder. We try to utilise him as a to uh, maximise his strength, which is his um, great left foot kick off the halfback flank and a bit of the wing, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if um, someone's seen something at the club where they've tried to utilise him um, inside and that um, his hands... And he's also... Um, Something we haven't spoken about is he's a great mark, a good contested mark for a, um, a guy to, big guy too. Well, he took 14 marks on the weekend. So, yeah, it's incredible. You, <laughs> yeah, you know, if you can get some mismatches where he's on a short and mid and um, isolate that one on one, just kick the ball to him, um, it's kind of like yeah, sometimes uh, Luke, Luke Park is able to, to make, make most of those opportunities. He's around about the same size as Cripps, isn't he? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, and you know, we'll, it's, it's well known how good Cripps is at um, at that role. Yeah, and Dawson wasn't the only one who started. I mean, we had a close to a hundred and fifty point win against NT Thunder. Uh, Kurt Tippett kicked five goals. Hayward led the goal kicking with six. Uh, Rose had three goals and twenty seven touches. Marsh had twenty nine touches and a goal. Fisher thirty one. Elia had twenty two touches and a goal. So it was really. Uh, good consistent performance. Alex Johnson, uh, in his uh, return, long awaited return from injury, had 16 touches, six marks, uh, also kicked it behind. Uh, so it's great to see everyone really pulling their weight. I think he might be ready for the senior team if he's kicking behinds. <laughs> well, he did kick that goal in his first game back. That was. Uh... He did, yep. But um, oh, but, I but... had a chance to watch him a few weeks ago. He looked. Um... He looked like he's enjoying his football again, which is really, really good, and it's absolutely fantastic to see him come back from uh, from so many injuries. And, and Ted, do you keep in contact with him at all? Um, yeah, Alex and I, uh, and I um, we're, yeah, we're, we're we're still close. I haven't spoken to him in a while, but um, I messaged him uh, before his his comeback game, and I'm I'm just so I think what's the word, mate? Proud. I'm so proud of where he's at right now and everything he's gone through. Um, I, I try and empathise to try and think what it would be like, but the reality is I've got no idea about what it would be like to have all the operations that he's he's gone through and all the setbacks and still to be able to, to get back on the horse and um, keep it that dream. So um, incredible, and I, I'm, I'm still hopeful that there's... Um, um, even more good news to come. Well, speaking of good news to come, the Swans' form line is very impressive at the moment. They've uh, gone 0-6 to 10-7, except for that very close loss to the Hawks. It could very well be knocking on the door of the top four. Now, do you think that the Swans can finish top four, Ted? Well, I can. someone asked me after... Um, I think we were zero and six, so we're going to make the finals. And I said, "Well, you can't ignore the numbers. Um, you know, it's 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 looking it's looking far less likely than likely." But um, if you look at you know the the form line and the, over the last few months, um, I can't see why not. That um, I think right now we're only four points away from third spot. Um, we've got a healthy we are, percent. Yes. We've got a healthy percentage, and. Um, and a lot can happen in one or two weeks, and who knows? Um, was there five weeks to go in the season? Yep. Yes, still five games. Yeah, five games to go. That's that's still a lot of football. Um, you know, the, the top four could be sorted out in two or three weeks' time. And if we have a quick look over some of the games that they've played, uh, I think this is quite impressive, the fact that St Kilda have played twice, who are finalists, or at least trying to be finalists. Uh, the Western Bulldogs, and the, this is one thing 
I think the Swans have struggled with quite a lot in recent times is the game after the bye. And we had the Western Bulldogs, who we played the last two times after the bye, and they knocked us off by four points. So it was really impressive to see the Swans come out and just give them an almighty walloping. That was a very nice win. Uh, Richmond, top four at the moment. They're definitely gunning for top four. Uh, Essendon, the uh, thrilling come-from-behind win. Again, talked about that ad nauseum. It's one of those occasions where perhaps maybe shouldn't have been in that uh, situation. Um, Melbourne, finals aspirant, Greater Western Sydney, top four. So the form line is absolutely impressive just how good the team has been. And last week, uh, Ted, had a look at some of the differences between the rounds. And the first six games, we scored 454. And then the next four games, scored just under 450. But since then, we've scored from rounds 12 to 18, we've scored 500 and roughly about 570. And we've conceded just over 430 um so that's an absolutely massive differential, and the form is absolutely fantastic at the moment. Yeah, you know, it's not often you hear um, numbers spoken about that way. It's good on you for um, analysing the game like that, but um, I'm always of the belief that um, it's uh, the scores against, which tells a lot more of um, how someone's going than the scores for. At the Swans, we're not a shootout team. We always try and defend first, and... Um, and uh, I think that's uh, the litmus test for how we're going. Well, if you have a look at since the buy, the four scores, they're all around about 85, except for 118 and on the weekend 101. Against is where it is really impressive, is 42, 50, 51, 59, and a couple of 80s and 171. Yeah, that's and, and like, like I said, that's... That is the litmus test. That is, that is when when we're playing well, we're a hard team to score against. And um, uh, some teams go out there, like I said, and try and do the shootouts and um, see who can score the most goals where we play on our terms. And that is, um, and I think that holds up well in fi- finals football. With the games coming up against Hawthorne and Geelong, do you think the Swans will be good enough to win those two games? Oh, I don't think you can take anything for granted. And, you know, I know that sounds like a uh, a political answer and I don't need to give answers <laughs> like that right now because I'm I'm playing and I can be arrogant and I can say whatever I want and I won't get fined. But um, <laughs> uh, um, what this season has taught us is you cannot, no, cannot assume anything because um, there is that much volatility week to week in teams' performance. Um, so... If you look at the ladder, we should beat both those teams, But um, and I'm sure this will be addressed, that um, if you go out there presuming anything, you'll be caught out. And um, so um, uh, is it? it's the Hawks this week on a Friday night. Um, form says we yep, should sure win. Is. Form says we should win, but um, this season seems to suggest that that's a red flag when you start presuming things because, uh, <laughs> God, it's a hard, hard season to predict. And the Hawks, have, the Hawks have been in a bit of good recent form as well, so we can't rule them out. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, I'm just wrapped. Well, no, I'm, I'm excited the fact that we've got, have got quite a presence on Friday night football this year and um, uh, there's nothing better than sitting down watching us on Friday night and uh, on prime time. And look, the Swans' form against Hawthorne hasn't exactly been, I'd say, golden or anything like that. We did manage to beat Hawthorne in the last, or the last time we played him at the MCG. Uh, that was the unfortunate game where you unfortunately knocked yourself out. And then uh, the previous game won by four points again at the MCG. Uh, but in between then, the Hawks have um, they've had the the number of the Swans or the measure of the Swans in Sydney. So it's a it's a bit of an interesting one where the Swans have done well against the Hawks in Melbourne, but not so well against them back, you know, in, in their home ground. So was there, um, when you played, was there like a little bit of a kind of like a mental sort of block or, or anything in that regard, or was it just the Hawks could really play the SEG fantastic and it was very hard to stop them at their best? No, nah, nothing mental at all. I think you just respect where respect is due is that the Hawks have been a very good team for 
what is I'm I'm thinking close to a decade now, and that um, with that they're a good team because they're consistent and they're, they're not reliant on trying to win home games and losing away games. That that they back it up each week, and that's why we found them a tough team to beat. And um, we always tried to emulate that and be consistent. But um, yeah, Hawks might have beaten us recently at the SCG a couple of times, but at the same time. They weren't blowouts. They were games where at certain stages of the game with a few minutes to go, or mate, um, we could have quite easily um, won the game too. So, um, uh, yeah, the rivalry continues, and um, who knows, it might continue again this week with um, yet another close game. Um, oh, yeah, just thoughts about the Hawthorne game as well. I think it's, um, like, it's at a completely different point of the season. If, even if you look back to... Um, when we played them in round 10 this year. I mean, Hawks have had uh, quite a few injury problems this year. Uh, we've had the amazing run of form, so I, I'm not entirely confident into making a tip, although my tip has been pretty awful this year anyway, so I'm not sure why I'm talking about that. Um, but look, I'll, I'll, I'll probably be at the game myself, and I think I think any way you look at it, it'll, it'll be a cracker between two Really great teams. And uh, Ted, will you be there at the match yourself? No, I, um, I've i actually uh, made a bit of a comeback and um, started playing football again. I played my first game last weekend for uh, the old Zavs, my old uh, school team. And um, so I've got a game of footy the next day and uh, um, I need to do what I can to actually um, get myself in some decent shape so I won't be going to the game. Uh, so I hope you'll be cheering the Swans on from your land room then. Of course I will. Yeah, of course. Um, and that's that's why I'm so excited about them playing on Friday night because um, uh, it's one of those games where it doesn't really matter who's playing. Everyone seems to watch it, no matter who, what team, uh, no matter what team they go for. And um, um, yeah, that's a lot of you get nostalgic Swans Hawthorne on the MCG in a big game because of. Um, the recent history between the two teams, and um, I'll be watching that and then uh, getting ready to put the boots on the, the next day. Now, it's um, Joey Kennedy's 200th game this weekend, and you know what a team to play against. His uh, childhood club and the first club he played at. And sort of, uh, do you see the guys really getting up for him for this game and doing their absolute best to, to see this one through for him? Yeah, you'd. In a perfect world, you'd like to think that something like this, even though it is a special occasion, shouldn't mean that uh, the Swans try even harder. But um, I think because naturally we we want to win every game and um, you don't need any extra motivation. But um, subconsciously, I do think that something like this does play a part. And um, Josh has been... I think arguably the best recruit that the Swans have ever had because the consistency that he has bought and what you know what little price that we had to pay for him. Um, so he's been huge to the club, and if there was in some small way that the players could give Josh a bit back in return to to make this night the celebration that it deserves to be, is um, I guess would make it even more special because. Um, Sheets. I remember uh, one thing that Kevin Sheedy said to me was, not that I remember too many things that he said to me, but uh, one is uh, <laughs> that um, you know you only celebrate your milestone games if you win them, and if you don't win them, you forget about them. So um, for Josh, the two hundredth is um, a lot. Unfortunately, will be determined whether the the Swans win or not as to um, whether he celebrates it or not. We'll look at some matchups. And obviously the teams haven't been released yet, but we can look at uh, what sort of Hawthorne are gonna gonna do. Now they've shuffled their team around quite a bit uh, this year. They've they're playing James Sicily uh, off the back line, and they also played Gunston at centre half back. So it's um, they're going for a bit of flexibility, and they're trying to change things up. And Rowan Schoen makers um, back back in 2012. Um, he was playing as a centre half back. Now he's playing almost as a full forward. So there's it's kind of hard to look at what the team's actually going to do because is James Sicily going to play forward? Is he going to play back? And 
one of the things that Hawthorne did quite well in the last time uh, the two teams played was they exploited the Swans' defence with their pace. They had three very fast forwards. So if Sicily does play forward, who do you think will go to him, Ted? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think um, I think probably a Rampy or a Malikin would be best suited for, for um, someone like that. Um, but Hawthorne just seems to be a, a team that I haven't actually watched too much of this year. Um, so I'm unaware too much of how much they've, uh, they've changed their, their strategy. Depending on position he's playing. Yeah, I think you've got to go into the game with versatility and do your homework on quite a few players, whether you're, um, your defence forward or mid. Um, gone are the days where most players start on one one player and play the whole game and finish on that player. So um, uh, we do know that Hawthorne are versatile and they'll make changes and um, Swans should do their due diligence to prepare for that. And do you think Buddy Franklin will have a uh, another day out? Oh, uh, I'm biased. I, 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 I'd love for him to, um, and but I've got no more insight than uh, than you guys as to if uh, that's going to happen or not. But uh, you know, I, I hope it does because um, you know where he sits in the Coleman, he's he's right up there with a chance to win it this year, and with only five games to go. He's going to start to need to um, capitalise um, on each week now. So I'll, just, I'll just butt in there. I'm just looking at uh, Hawthorne's injury list at the moment. Uh, they're without Birchall. They'll probably probably be without uh, James Frawley. They're without Gibson. They're without Stratton. That's pretty much all their experienced defenders. So they're looking at probably someone like Kurt Headley, who's been doing an all right job as a key defender for them. Uh, Brand as well. They're, they're these really young guys. So... If I had to put, if I had to put money on it, also gamble responsibly, um, <laughs> I, I, I probably would. I probably would uh, probably guess that Buddy might have it. Might have a night out on a Friday night at the G. I reckon. Yeah, well, he loves the big time football, and um, he does play well on the big stage. And uh, yeah, I, it'd be wouldn't it be exciting to see him uh, run a mark with a bag of eight? Oh, yeah, it sure would. <laughs> well, he um, tore the game apart in the first half the last time they played. He uh, kicked the, the five goals, but he kicked four, I think it was, in the first half and single-handedly kept the Swans within touch. And I think that was an instance of uh, looking from the outside again where maybe the occasion got to some of the players or maybe some of the players were trying too hard to do too much. What, what did you think of that, Ted, when you were watching that game? Um, oh, to be honest, I can't actually remember too much about that game. How, how much how, was this a few months ago? Yeah, it's the one um, round ten when Lloyd was knocked out. Oh, I don't know, like the first contest of the game, and then Sam Reed went down again with concussion about two minutes before halftime. Oh, and we ended up just losing by a bit. Yeah, I, I can't remember yeah. the specifics about that, but um, uh, yeah, I can just remember it being a, a great physical contest and. Um, Unfortunately, we missed out on the win. Yeah, I do remember that game a bit. Well, one thing I remember particularly from it was I was looking at uh, Hawthorne's heat map and where they got all their possessions and the kind of Hawthorne's defensive 50. And if you kind of look up the... Just going up the, w- the wings, it was all red. They, had, they were playing so much uncontested ball behind the play and playing that kind of patient footy. Um, and we just didn't seem to have a answer to that. But... I think we've come a fair way since then, so hopefully we'll have a answer to it. And on the bigger MCG as well, it might not work as well for Hawthorne. Yeah, look, it's um, certainly been a, a change in game style. Would you would you agree, Ted, that the Swans have sort of adjusted their game style as the season has gone on? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure how to uh, kind of say that we have just the one game style. I, I think we're we're versatile and we adapt and um, we try and attack where we see weaknesses in opposition and we try and make sure that we uh, we defend in, in, um, so we're prepared for opposition strengths. So um, um, Hawks had a much publicised game style over the last decade with their kicking ability. The Dogs had a quite a well-known 
game style with their handball, but um, I'm not sure how to how to pigeonhole our game style right now. I think it's just a it's a well rounded um, game that's suitable for all kind of conditions, and that we're we're not too reliant on just one form of avenue to scoring. Uh, and there was there's been games where the Swans, especially early in the season, were racking up well thirty tackles in a game, but other games they were racking up almost 100. Uh, I think there was one game where they actually racked up more than 100 tackles. But even against the Saints, uh, I think they racked up 63 tackles and their season average has been around about that mark. But the pressure has been, I think, compared to last season, um, and you might think differently as playing for the team at the time, but it seems that the Swans pressure itself has been definitely improved in the forward half of the ground. Um, there's more players in there that they're rotating through the forward line who can tackle and chase, and they're very quick as well. Yeah, that that is something that we've been known for for a long time, and um, that I think you were going through quite a few stats before about um, kicks, handballs, and the heat maps and, and things like that, but I, I think the most underrated stat in football is tackles. It's... Um, it's got a tackle's got a lot to do with what some, your team's mindset is, and um, how desperate they are, and their attitude. And um, um, if you're missing tackles, broken tackles, it, it's it's terrible. But if you are making tackles hurt, like we saw with Isaac Heaney, then it's a great reflection on where the team's mindset's at. Oh, absolutely. And just to correct myself, it was fifty three. And I think that's quite amazing that over the course of that game, it was only 107 tackles last week for both teams. Now, uh, it's time for a little bit of Q&A from our listeners. Are you ready, Ted? Yep. Okay, so the first one is from Penny from Facebook. What was it like playing on Buddy in the 2012 Grand Final, especially since he had a dodgy ankle? Well, you having a dodgy ankle, not him. He had the dodgy ankle last year. Yeah. (laughs) Um, well, I was, I was just incredibly nervous. I was really, really concerned that I was going to be a liability for the team and that if I couldn't run out the game and I had to be subbed out, well, before quarter time, then I, um, and we were to lose, I, I thought that, um, a lot would have to do with that. And I couldn't test my ankle because they didn't want me to train on it with it. We didn't want me to run on it, but they, they, the physios and doctors said they'd be able to get me up for the game. So I was just... I wasn't confident that um, of how it would feel, but we, we went in with a plan of what we could do to get me through the game, and um, it worked. All righty. Our next question, Paddy from Instagram. Who, in your opinion, is the best midfield defender, midfielder, and forward you've played with at the Swans? Oh, that's, a, uh, that's a very tough question. I, I should uh, pause for five or ten minutes or a reflection before I give answers here, but... Um, um, uh, because all right, I'll start from down back, and I'm just, I'm just going to say this guy because he was a mentor for me early days, and I, I was just um, so in awe of his ability to to win um, contests so undersized, and that's Craig Bolton um, being a captain of the club too, and that's no disrespect to Heath Grundy or Leo Barry or any any other matter of defender, but um, Craig's I'm going to put Craig up as the defender. The midfielder, um, uh, I probably should say Goodsy because of everything he, he's achieved, but um, I was going to say Joey Kennedy, but I've, I've got to put Goodsy there. Um, for what Goodsy, he's, the impact that he could could give, on, and um, he was a real catalyst in games. He could just move himself into the midfield and, and, and really just turn games. And I know I can remember standing back at full back and watching Goodsy from the goal square in absolute awe. And I knew that my teammate, my opponent, was equally enjoying watching the spectacle in the, you know, <laughs> as much as I was. So, um, yeah, he, he is someone that... Um, um, I'll probably have to describe to my son one day what it was like playing with him. And um, as, as a forward, um, uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say Buddy. Um, to be able to have him as a teammate and um, 
you, what buddies done for the Swans, more so AFL in New South Wales, is is he brings an excitement that um, no no one else has, has brought to the game, and um, um, that's all due respect to the Barry Halls of the world and and the Brett Kirks and everyone else, but um, yeah, Buddy is a, a freakish talent that um, in a similar vein to Goodsy. Sometimes I'm just a spectator at the other end of the ground, just watching on in awe of what they're able to do. And um, what did you think about his long goal um, two weekends ago? The one where he kicked from the boundary. Yeah, well, people people talk, you know, about how exciting and um, how surprising it is, but the guy's been doing it for over ten years. Um, it isn't. It isn't. Um, He's not pulling it out of nowhere. He's been backing it up and doing that, and um, uh, I, it's it's we're, we're just so fortunate um, that we've got him on our team. And um, I said this to someone else the other day that whether Buddy sees out his nine-year deal or not isn't going to determine what his legacy is by how he plays in his seventh, eighth, or ninth year. What Buddy's done so far is more than what we could have hoped for at the Swans and um, his legacy should be determined on that and not by what will, what may or may not happen um, in the years ahead. Yeah, absolutely. and Couldn't agree with more. I think he's um, more than paid for his contract, I'd say twice over the way he's performed. And, and the amazing thing is, uh, looking at it last year, and I ca- and a lot of us keep track of the membership numbers. Is I think the membership was below thirty thousand in twenty twelve when we won the premiership, and now it's almost sixty thousand. Yeah, and um, you know, I, and I'm not even playing it. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was all you, mate. It was all you. Yeah, <laughs> we, we miss you, Teddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, you could. Well, you can still cut your teeth, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, to, to be fair, you know, a, a lot of that is Buddy has brought the game to a, to a, a part of the market that um, otherwise weren't so interested in football and weren't aware of maybe the rules and the basics of the game, but they knew number 23 for the Swans is Buddy Franklin and they, were, and they wanted to come and watch him play. Well, I think everyone does. It's uh, I've got to say, I didn't like Hawthorne, but you just, you couldn't stop watching what he was doing. It was freakishly good at times. Um, now, uh, back on Goods, you did say Goods was your favourite midfielder. Um, I actually wanted to ask you what your favourite Goods moment was. Now, I will, before you answer, I will say what my favourite Goods moment moment was. And it was when he went into the midfield after doing his, uh, was it his PCL in the mm-hmm. grand final in the uh, right. third quarter. And he went, in, went into the midfield and he won the ball clean and just ran forward and bombed it long. I thought that was, given what he was going through at the time, that was just unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Goodson and I probably played close to close to 200 games together. So we've got quite a sample size for me to choose favourite moments from. But um, And I'm, I'm kind of going to select this because it popped up in my, in my mind so quickly. But I feel like in 2006, even though we lost the grand final, I can remember going down to the rooms at half time, and we were down by a sizable amount. Um, West Coast were all over us. Um, it was looking like it could be an ugly day for the for the club, not just losing, but losing embarrassingly. And we went out there. We decided at the half time that we, you know, of course we we're going to um, turn it round. But it wasn't until Goodsey, I think might have got a centre clearance and just kicked an incredible goal at the start of the third quarter that was the catalyst for us to start our comeback. um, And I I know that it may not have the the happy ending to that story, but little moments like that is is what excites the crowd and and, um, motivates the team to, um, to kick on. I think that moment is still in the AFL's like top 10 or top 25 final moments as well. Uh, opening bounce, bang, goal. It was just, it's on. It's it, on. It just, it just made a statement to West Coast that, um, yeah, I, I think it made a statement that the game wasn't over. You know, you might be in front, but we're coming back. And that's what happened. We did come back. 
Um, like I said, it doesn't have the um, the ending we did, but there was that's just one occasion where Goodie's done something like that, where he might have been might have started forward, but he's he's moved himself onto the ball and been the one to say, "Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna make the stand here, and I'm gonna change the direction of this game." If there ever was a big game player, I think uh, I think it was it. Uh, he was incredible. Now uh, the next question is Bonnie from Facebook. Are you still good friends with Joe Watson, and how often do you catch up with him? Uh, yes, yeah, um, yeah, still friends with him. Um, we caught up for a coffee last week, and um, um, Joe and I have known each other since five or six. Um, um, yeah, he's a uh, he's a ripping guy, um, and. Um, uh, yeah, he's um, a lifelong friend. All righty. Our next question comes uh, from the Swans Big Footy Forum. So we've got Brendan here asking, were there changes in the way you had to defend at the start of your career, up to the end of career, up to the end of your career, and what did you have to change in order to get better and to adapt to the game? Yeah, that's a, that's quite a what's quite an interesting question. Um, some of the to get specific, some of the terminology changed and how how I defend. Um, we start talking about defending shoulders with um, trying to push forwards into, um, I guess, non dangerous territory. But that was something. That was a bit of a something that started to change with talking about forward presses and, I guess, defenders becoming a bit more attacking and how they defend, constantly pushing up as opposed to just. The analogy we use is cars and caravans, just being the caravan following you forward all around the field, which it may have been decades ago. But um, I try, I, I tried to be versatile and adapt with the game, and um, um, it was for me. It was a, about 2010. I kind of gave myself a bit of a an assessment, and I tried to become a the next Scarlet Rutten. Darren Glass. I looked, at, I looked up at these guys, and I could say that, see these guys were big, strong centre half backs, and that's, that's who I wanted to emulate and be like. Now, uh, the next question is again from Brennan from Big Footing. Did you feel playing forward early in your career better prepared you for playing in defence? I, I think it did. I think it did, but um, uh, because I, I was, I was, and maybe it gave me um, insight as to different avenues for, for how to kick goals and what annoys forwards. But um, for me, I think it was just experience of playing games and and getting as much insight as I can from there. But um, to answer the question, I, I think it is great to have a, a rounded game where you, you understand how a forward's trying to kick a goal and cut that out so that they can't take that opportunity. All righty. Uh, next question comes from Andrew, also from Big Footy. Uh, do players and teammates talk about impending end of contracts and whether or not out of contract players would stay? Uh, so, for example, would the guys last year have wondered or talked about Tom Mitchell uh, and whether he was going to stay? And uh, also with Sam Reid and Zach Jones this year. Yeah, that's a, that's a different one. Um, uh, I, I I don't think you can just draw a line and say all, all examples are the, the same. Um, with uh, Lewis Jetta's situation, um, even though Jets didn't say it at the time, I, I knew that there was a real, um, I guess, desire to go back to WA for family reasons, and um, Jets, Jets didn't say that. But I, I empathised with that because I can understand with uh, having young kids and... Um, a wife from WA that there's there can be that and um, with Tommy's situation um, that was much publicised but guys might have spoken about it from time to time because um, we don't have a head in the sand we're aware of the football world but it's not normally in a spoken about in a in an open forum um, I guess um, that's just sometimes things will be spoken about sometimes um, they're still a bit unknown, I guess. Yeah, because, I mean, you guys are 
you guys play together on the field, but you also have relationships with each other off the field as well. And you can't, it, I guess it's different for each player, but you got yeah. it. Yeah. You, you're right. And, um, some guys you're closer with than others. And, um, you know, if, if it is one of the, the co- cause it's, you know, say 45 guys on the list. And if it is one of the closer guys, um, you might have a relationship where you can discuss everything. And that is how you're going. Where do you think you'll be playing next year? How's the, the contract going? Um, are you happy with how it's, how the process is going? And, um, with others, you might be a bit more respectful of, of their privacy and, um, empathize that they might have, more than one stakeholder that's involved in the, the discussion as to where they're going to live next year and try and be a bit more compassionate that, um, for, for some of these situations because um, um, if you look at me, I, I tried to keep it as, as private as I could when I was at Essendon that I was going to leave because um, – but um, I was fortunate in that no one really cared at the time that I, I, I wanted to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, the next question is, uh, got the goods from, again, Big Footy. Uh, there's a lot of questions from Big Footy. I see you played a game for old Zabs on the weekend. You know, how did you pull up? And, you know, will you make this a regular thing? Uh, that, uh, well done, who picked up on uh, picked up that? Yeah, I, I played my first game since I retired last year, and... Um, um, I kicked one four, um, so I had quite a few shots on goal. But just um, yeah, kicked the, uh, so, it sounds uh, like yeah, sounds like you played for the Sydney Swans. <laughs> 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 well, um, I had a lot of fun, and uh, but um, I also was quite sore, and uh, so I, um, I think I might play one more, maybe two more, but uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to see the see the season out. Oh, it's a bit of a shame. I was hoping for a little part of me was hoping for a late season callback to the Sydney Swan seniors. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Teddy come back, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think we've got a, I think horse has got horse horse has got a um enough uh competition for spots in the reserves right now. He doesn't need a, a has been trying to get back in there. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sure if, if horse is listening. <laughs> Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. hey, right, give a horse a shout out if he's listening. Hey, horse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alrighty. Our last question from our listeners, also from Big Footy. Jay-Z asks, uh, which teammates did you draw the greatest motivation from and why? Um, oh, good question. Uh, I think I won't label it by position. I think I, I draw the inspiration from... Um, the hardness and the courage that um, just off the top of my head, a, a Jude Bolton, a Brett Kirk or a Luke Parker has shown where they will throw them or, or a Dan Hanabry will they'll throw themselves into a contest um, and put their body on the line. It's, it's, it's a, a saying that said a lot, but it really, as a teammate, you're in awe of what someone will do in it. And it really does motivate you to, 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 I guess lift your performance as to um, when you've got teammates doing things like that. So um, um, I, I naturally wanted to say I'm motivated by my defenders, but um, I'll be a bit more open and honest and say that um, that hardness and that that hard edge is uh, fantastic to play alongside. This isn't one question that we uh, raised before, but speaking about fellow defenders, what was it like playing next to Craig Bolton and then Heath Grundy and... Heath Grundy himself, he's had arguably a fantastic career as a centre-half back, full-back, and he just seems to get better the older he gets. Yeah, I, I, isn't he just a, an underrated player for the club? Um, the role that he plays, he's an incredibly successful shutdown defender that is also underrated in his attacking ability. Um and, um, yeah, I'm biased because I saw for so many years of the great role that um, Reg plays for us. And um, Reg takes – he enjoys going under the radar. He steers clear away from the microphones and the limelight. He wants to just do his job without any recognition. And um, 
that makes me even more excited and proud of what he's what he's able to do. But um, um, yeah, um, at some stage we'll have to find another Heath Grundy. I think Malikin's um, doing a terrific job putting his hand up for that role. And one of the things that I found absolutely amazing about last year's final series, uh, excluding the final game result, of course, was the fact that in the first three rounds, Heath Grundy had just one goal kicked on him. Yeah. And so um, that that was yeah, incredible. Yeah. And that's Reg Grundy in a nutshell, just, just doing his job without too much fanfare. Okay, so now it's just time to move on to our good call, bad call of the previous week. Now, um, Stephen Park, one of our regulars, he predicted the Swans by 23 and Buddy by, by five goals. Almost, but not quite there, so uh, I have to cross that one off. Now, he had the Suns to win, and Gary Ablett to get 40 possessions. Now, um, not quite sure that eventuated, but the Suns did win. Uh, and no, the Suns beat- Dun- lost against the Bulldogs. Oh, that's right, they did. So I'm thinking of previous week. No, that definitely didn't come. Definitely right. didn't. And uh, Melbourne to beat Port Adelaide, uh, which we talked about last week. Uh, he got that one. Big tick there. Now, Stephen, you had Buddy to kick four goals and eight different goal kickers. Uh, oh, well, I, think <laughs> we, I think we had about eight or nine different goal kickers, but we almost got that one. Almost. Melbourne to beat Port Adelaide, you got that one. And uh, Fremantle versus Hawthorne, winning margin two goals. Yeah, no. Not quite. No. Mine were, were, I thought they were safe, but they were bad. Uh, West Coast, Eagles to beat Collingwood. Did not happen. Uh, Swans by 10 goals. Bloody six goals. Not quite. And I had Crows Cats draw with the GWS Tigers draw. Did not happen. Although that would have been, that would have been fantastic. Now, um, I had Sinclair Ted, to kick you're... five. Sinclair to kick five. I'll tell you <laughs> what, if you were a betting man and you put money on that, you would have made a <laughs> mint. <laughs> you could have retired. <laughs> I actually, um, I was saying before the game, he's going to get the first goal of the game. I, I wish I think, actually, um, yeah. I, I actually thought when he kicked it too, I thought, I wonder the stupid person that put that on because, uh, you know, um, Sinks wouldn't have kicked that too, uh, too many times over the last few years and uh, then he backed it up with five. Oh, it's a beautiful game that he played. Superb too. Now, um, if you're willing, could you please provide us with three predictions for the weekend, Ted? Oh, to be honest, I haven't even looked that. I haven't even looked ahead. Um, I might <coughs> have to reserve my judgment and get back to you there because I, I I can't even tell you who's playing. All right, no worries. Well, uh, we'll start off with Stephen, if you could, please. All righty. So my first prediction this week. Uh, Friday Night Lights, uh, Buddy loves it at the G. I reckon he'll kick at least five goals against Hawthorne. So Ooh, mark, nice. that one, mark that one down. Uh, my second prediction uh, also concerns a key forward. One in great form and also just really quite a joy to watch, uh, especially for someone who's in a team who's not performing quite as well. Ben Brown from North Melbourne. I reckon he'll kick five goals against uh, Melbourne. Five goals, Ben Brown, nice. And my third prediction... Uh, I'm gonna might not be too risky, a bit of a coin toss. Whoop! Ah, oh, he's dropped again. That's right. We'll come back to him. Ah, uh, well, for me, I, I just think this season, if we look at um, how it's tracked so far, it's that, that what happens one week, the opposite happens the next week. And um, with Brisbane Lions having a great win against Carlton. I'll say say that that um that form will turn around. Who are, I don't even know who the Lions have got next week. West Coast. They've got yeah, West Coast at Domain. I'll say they'll lose by eighty points over at Domain. <laughs> That's a big win. Eagles by yeah. eighty. Yep, no worries. Um, yeah, and that's uh, all, that's all I've got. <laughs> that's all right. That's a safe one. Now um, I am going to go Swans by four goals. Uh, I think, um, honestly, they should be winning by a little bit more, but um, I actually haven't got a, a right Sydney project prediction all year, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I reckon St Kilda can beat Port Adelaide. Yeah, I, I, I understand where you're coming from there because Saints' best is still really good, but um, I think the Port coming off a loss 
um, they should get a bit of a wake up call after that loss to Melbourne last week and playing it. I think they're playing at Adelaide Oval, playing for top four. Um, that they should bounce back there. So I, I'm in disagreements with you there. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Now there is a little bit of logic behind it because Footy Logic says that Port Adelaide haven't beaten a team inside the top eight when they've played them. Now St Kilda aren't in the top eight, but they're on the edge. So it's a it's a fifty fifty game. They're actually just percentage outside the top eight anyway. Now, my last one, I've got Collingwood backing up. I reckon they're going to beat the Crows. I like that. I, I, I think uh, there's, a, there's a bit there. Um, the Pies on the MCG um, after a bit of a win. Yeah, I, yeah I, can see, I can see that. All right. Now, um, unfortunately, we've lost Stephen, so we'll just have to go with these five goals for Buddy. <laughs> uh, now, Ted, thank yep. you very much for joining us tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure having you on. Thanks for having me. You can follow us on social media. You can always send us questions and comments for the next podcast, which will be next week. And our next special guest is going to be Russell Robertson, the Melbourne Forward Star. Thank you again for listening. And until next time, 